Welcome back to iCars Repairs Realm. As you probably could tell from that uh, brief introduction there, we're here to, today to talk a little bit about the Ford F-150 Lightning. And uh, joining us remotely, I believe we have uh, Mr. Jerry Banani. Jerry, if you'd like to uh, go ahead and introduce yourself to the group and thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, glad to be with you. I'm at the Paint Body Technology Center today and uh, just glad to be part of this and uh, look forward to any questions, anything that comes up. Thanks, Jerry. And uh, to my right, we have... I'm Jeffrey Poole, subject matter expert with ICAR and leader of the uh, SME team. And I'm Joel Dufkis. I'm one of the EV and ADAS technicians here at ICAR. And I am Bud Center Director of Technical Products and Curriculum. So we're here today to talk a, a little bit about the, the Ford F-150 Lightning. And Jeff, I know that you went out and... Uh, yeah, I had an opportunity to visit uh, folks at Precision Diagnostics, and we've got a little intro clip here, O2, if you'd roll that, please. Hi, we're here at Precision Diagnostics in Madison, Wisconsin, with Joel Adcock. We're going to take a look at the new F-150 Lightning pickup. Joel, this is a beautiful facility. Thanks for having us. Jeff, we appreciate you guys being here. This is a great opportunity to take a look at the F-150 Lightning truck, have you guys dissect a little bit. And uh, again, we appreciate you guys being here and looking forward to maybe doing some more of these in the future as well. Very good. All right, let's get into it. So as we took a look at the vehicle, um, we basically went around and we had some, we had the ability to disassemble some of the aspects of it and take a closer look. And uh, you can go ahead and roll the next clip 03. And as we take a look at the, uh, the vehicle body, um, you know, you're gonna see that there's a lot of similarities to the, uh, to the sibling vehicle uh, F-150s that are non-BEV. Um, perhaps, uh, Jerry, if you could take a moment and uh, give us kind of a high level of, you know, the similarities and potential differences that we might see. Yeah, certainly. When you're looking at the overall structure, it is the same as any other F-150. The aluminum panels, the structural parts of it, the actual repairs are very, very similar, if not identical. Uh, you do have some subtle differences within the bed, uh, but that's going to be obvious as you work with the truck. But as far as apron tubes and structure and everything else of the unit body, business as usual. Oh, very good. So really quick, um, I've got workshop manual open here. And because, uh, you know, as folks go in there and they start referencing, and we always recommend folks, uh, you know, reference the PTS uh, Ford workshop manual for each of the vehicles they're working on. Um, I do have it open on my laptop. And what you'll find in the navigation tree is because this vehicle does have some differences in some suspension components and other unique nuances, where there is something that is different from the sibling trucks that are not electrified, um, you'll find that it actually has electric after that particular part or component, whatever it happens to be, and the associated operation to define where there are those unique differences. So that's just gonna be something that uh, as you're doing your research, writing a repair order, a repair plan for the vehicle, you wanna keep that in mind. Otherwise, you'll see a lot of the same nomenclature and uh, you know, identification of operations in there as you would for the, for the regular trucks. And if we could um, roll 04, please. So in, in this particular case, we're looking at the front of the vehicle and in many aspects, it visually looks different because of the trim and uh, the, the attributes of the vehicle. But what you're gonna find is that from an advanced driver assist systems aspect, um, you're going to see a lot of the same things you see on the sibling vehicles, where we've got our parking sensors and our um, CCM, that's the forward-facing radar on, uh, on their vehicles. And then what we're seeing on the mach -E's and the uh, other sibling F-150s is where there's the potential of the front corner radar modules that uh, start to play into the blue, screw, blue cruise features and things like that. So just be aware of, of those items if you've got a vehicle hitting the front. Uh, damage um, where uh, potentially those sensors are located and uh, where there might have to be additional operations considered as you're repairing the vehicle. Now, IPMA, uh, which is the windshield mounted camera we're looking at right here, is very similar again to the sibling vehicles in the lineup. Um, it uses a lot of the same architecture for the ADAS systems where the camera is a camera reporting to IPMA control module which all of the sensor technologies report to on this vehicle and the fusion of data happens for the operation of those systems. What are we looking at there, Joel? So we're looking at the charge port on the vehicle, which is 
uh, very similar if you've seen the Mustang Mach-E, it's the same basic charge port. You have your uh, CCS type one connector, which is when you pull down the little latch, shows you your DC fast charging connector, and on top it has a J1772 connector, typical AC wall plug. Um, <clears throat> It has a little, a little uh, indicator on there to tell you how much, how full the battery is when you plug it in and stuff like that. So, so, so Bud, um, looking at that charge port and where it's located, any thoughts around fender repairs, fender replacements, and it's things like be, that? It's going to be a little more challenging, right? You need to, you need to be thinking about that that charge port that's in the fender. What's going to be required? What do you have to pull out of there? What if, you know? And also, what's, what's behind? What's too. behind it exactly? Yeah, it's, it's, it's going to be a little later bit more. On, you'll see under the hood whenever we take the uh, the front tub out. Um, where some of those cables are back in behind there, and there's a lot going on underneath of that tub, so uh, we'll take a closer look at that a little bit later on. Uh, let's go ahead and roll 07, which of course we're looking at the right fender, and uh, in this particular case, there's just a trim panel there. Um, yeah, nothing, matches, uh, matches the right, so that it matches the other side, symmetrical, and I, I would almost have to speculate that if you know these were going under a right-hand drive market, that might uh, change the position of the charge port, but. Uh, and also down in the corners, we have the parking sensors for the, right. for the park assist. So, absolutely. And you'll find that there's similar parking sensors on the ends of the rear bumper as well. Um, and pretty traditional system integrated with, uh, with the parking features on the which vehicle. Is, which is very similar to the, to the non-electric uh, F-150s. Yeah. yeah. So, so far we've made it through the front bumper and the ADAS sensors, and already there's a lot of, th a lot of things for collision repairs to think about. Absolutely. There's a lot of technology in the front of this vehicle. Yep. You know, the charge port is, is in the fender, something else you need to think about, and all the cables behind there. So, you know, just a lot to think about. Absolutely. Um, as we continue on to 08, I'm just looking at the side of the vehicle, and, and I did quite a bit of research, you know, looking to see where potentially there were differences. And just looking at the doors, um, it's pretty much business as usual for any F-150 whenever it comes to the doors and the features of the doors. Obviously, depending on your trim level and the options that are on the vehicle, this one has the 360 surround view. And uh, Joel, what can you tell us about a calibration on a 360 surround view on these late model Fords? So <clears throat> on this model here, it's gonna be a dynamic calibration. So you're basically gonna set up FDRS and go into the calibration Click calibrate, drive it around until it says you're done, and that's about it. So pretty straightforward so far as that goes. And let's take us to um, 09. And this is just taking a closer look at the door handle and the, uh, the keypad, which we're, again, we're accustomed to seeing this on uh, Ford vehicles for many, many years now. So no real surprises here as we start to, I want to say, look at those aspects of the vehicle. So one of the cool things on this, going through the service manual and the owner's manual on this truck was that with the keypad, you can actually open the power frunk really? with, the key, with the keypad. Okay. After you put your code in, you press the 7-8 button and hold it down, and that'll pop the front up for you. Very nice. So as we pan towards the back, the uh, look at the bedside panel and the features of that. Um, ultimately, this is... As Jerry pointed out at the beginning of the broadcast, um, a lot of the similar aspects on replacing this as if it were a non-electrified. Now, something we'll have to keep in mind that uh, I, I say it that way, um, this is an EV, it does have a high voltage battery. And once you take that bed off of there, it's gonna reveal a view of a lot of things that, that aren't on the uh, non-electrified sibling. So I haven't uh, had the opportunity yet to get into the service procedures and look at it, but we know what are some of those things that are different with the uh, between the, the standard vehicle and the electric vehicle with the, the bed? Um, so far as the bed itself, the, the actual service of parts on that is pretty much the same as the, the non-EV siblings. It's, it's really just a matter of once you take that bed off of there, you're going to be looking at a lot of stuff that you're going you're gonna to see the, mo the inverter sitting on top of the rear drive motor you're gonna see an AC compressor underneath of there because it has two AC systems on it. And you're gonna see the top of the battery enclosure, you know, once you, once you remove that. And so depending on what kind of work you're doing around the shop, of course, you're gonna to wanna to make sure that you're taking proper precautions and um, making sure that, uh, you know, we're protecting the vehicle appropriately. Inside the bed, inside the bed you're gonna find, uh, depending on the trim levels and stuff, you might find their pro onboard power, which is the uh, outlets and stuff in the back there. So you might have to do dis some disconnecting on there, depending on what level of power it has there, it might be a little bit different. Yep, that's correct. And I think um, 12 is our next uh, segment. 
Um, again, this is just kind of showing a close up of what we're used to seeing on these vehicles, the factory self-piercing rivets that, uh, that are attached in the bedside. Um, and of course, uh, the lightning trim label there. And then we transition to the tail light, which is where the blind spot sensors are. And we've been used to that for many years now on these as well. So again, that's pretty much business as usual. And interesting note on, on these, um, there's no calibration procedure for the blind spot. They, they auto calibrate without even being told to do so. So it doesn't even take FDRS to do that. So this truck had the power down, power up tailgate. Pretty neat feature. And with that, understand that that power down, power up motor actuator is actually built in to the tailgate. And there is a procedure to take and unplug that actuator motor if you need to take the tailgate out for service purposes and uh, then you can detach after you remove the wiring harness. Um, if you are dealing with that, there is a rear camera for the 360 surround system that is in that tailgate, which uh, there is a connector underneath of there. Just be really careful with that connector and that piece of the harness. Um, not that you shouldn't be careful with all connectors and all harnesses, but um, um, th that one, if you're not careful, you'll break the connector. <laughs> Would that, if you pull the tailgate off for a service or something like that, would you be required to do a 360 camera calibration on that then? Yes, it does require the uh, 360, but that again, dynamic. Once again, yeah, dynamic, yep. just plug yeah. it in FDRS and drive it. Yeah. So we're just looking at the back of the truck. And, the, and again, uh, other than some minor differences in the trim or the appearance of the truck, um, you know, the overall procedures involved are very similar to the non EV variant and the appearance of the trailer hitch and the receiver and the uh, lighting connectors and the parking sensors. Um, pretty traditional. Yeah, all the ultrasonics are same, same position, same everything as, uh, as its gasoline cousin, so. Yep. And so now we get into, I wanna say the fun part of it for me, <laughs> and, and that was uh, where we started to get into 15, where we, we opened the hood here, uh, so power open. And the actuator mechanism that's on this, we're gonna see a closer view of that here in a few minutes. Uh, Joel, what are we looking at over here on the driver's so, side? The green connector there is your your uh, high voltage or your low voltage disconnect for the uh, battery electric system. So when you need to do a, a shutdown of the vehicle, you can open the front up there and get to that connector without having to pull tons of panels out, which is kind of nice. It's not uh, buried away underneath a lot of stuff. And there's a couple of different ways for shutting down that high voltage. That's one of them. Um, there's also a scan tool procedure that goes along with it with FDRS. Yeah, so the scan tool procedure um, will walk is... you through will walk you through the steps of how to do it. Um, and then there's a manual method as well, which can all be found in the workshop manual. Very good. And let's take a look at uh, 17. So 17, we start to take out the, uh, the underhood trim. And you'll see where there's some little uh, retainer clips there that you basically twist 90 degrees and then uh, you can lift up on the panels and remove those panels. The inner perimeter clips are a little tougher than uh, a little more friction there than the outer perimeter ones. But uh, we'll get that front tub. And so the 12 volt battery is hidden behind this little panel in the middle, so we can access that. So and Jeff, Jeff, how, how hard was it to pull this this front tub out? It, well, at first, because I hadn't taken out all the bolts. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know, something about Jeff, you know better. Look at workshop manual first. Hey, there's four workshop more bolts manual down there. Procedures, Mr. Poole. A a absolutely, absolutely. And uh, that that, uh, that that taught me to uh, you know always go back to that. But um, so there's actually a metal hoop that goes across underneath of, underneath of the plastic tub that bolts onto the structure of the vehicle on each side. And so it came out very easily. I did have to have a little bit of help lifting that out of there. It's a little bit uh, awkward for one person to do, but uh, we got that out of the way. And that revealed all the goodies underneath. So once you remove that tub, it's, for me, it's an impressive view. There's a lot going on under there. And for them to, afford having that front tub and the openness of it, you'll notice there's no upper tie bar. You know, and there's no, I'm gonna say radiator. Well, the radiator and the cooling module, condenser unit, they are down there. They're laid down at a pretty steep angle, down low on the front of the vehicle. So you can see all of the, uh, the plumbing and other, other attributes. And we can stay paused on this for just a moment. You'll notice there's two receiver dryers. Again, I'd mentioned there's two separate AC systems. They wanna take care of that high voltage battery and then they wanna take care of the people in the vehicle. And uh, they're very strategically 
do that. And that's something unique with the F-150, that Lightning, that I haven't seen in any other uh, battery electric vehicles at this point yet, where they have two separate AC systems, one for the uh, battery, it's the battery and motor and stuff, and then one for the actual uh, uh, cabin. But so I would say it's an impressive view, and it, and it is. But this is also another area that we uh, we need to point out that somebody that's going to work on these vehicles needs to have the appropriate training, the appropriate PPE, understand what they're getting into, you know, go into the service procedures and understand what you're dealing with before you dig in. Yeah, you need to have that appropriate training. You need to know what you're doing. I, I will One thing to consider here too. Uh, take a look. The simple part of this, if you see the side structure, the apron tubes, the, the uh, front tie, what was the main radiator support, now is totally different shape, but it is still a bolt in part. But look at how the apron tubes look exactly like the steel vehicle. I mean, like the, the gasoline vehicle, excuse me. Yeah, yeah. Gl glad you brought that up. I was uh, kind of thinking that direction. And, and so basically servicing of those apron tubes is exactly the same as once you get past exactly. The, the differences and the electrified aspects of this, um, that basic procedure is still the same. Yes. Yeah. So I, I will note, you'll note the, the actuators that are on each side that open and close the hood. Um, they, they're rather long and very similar to uh, a vehicle with, a, with an electric opening rear gate or hatch. Um, down each side of those fenders, what looks like weather strips are the pinch strips. So they're the anti-pinch strips. They're actually sensors that if somebody has their arm in there, whenever that starts coming down or there's something in there blocking the way, uh, that's designed to take and, uh, you know, warn that system and it'll stop the closure operation and back it back up and open it back up. So we're looking at the hood latch mechanism. And you'll notice off to the, I'm gonna say the left-hand side of that particular image, and we'll get a, maybe a little closer view in one of the other shots a little bit later. But that, the actuator motor for that, because it has the, uh, the drawdown mechanism. And so there's a multitude of cables that run back and forth across the front of that next to that wiring harness um, that uh, help with the operation of that particular feature on the vehicle. So here we're just looking at the left inner apron area, if you will. Um, get a better view of that shotgun rail and the back behind the master cylinder, which this is an integral uh, master cylinder slash ABS unit. And uh, there were some cables that were running behind there. They were coming in from the charge port over to some of the control modules and down to the battery. And then this is the right hand side where we get a little better view of um, some of the air conditioning components. And we see a little water pump down there. We'll see a little closer view of here in just a moment as well. So there. If you get one of these vehicles where it's been in a more intrusive collision, obviously uh, that starts to get deeper into the different components that are mounted in those areas that we just really need to take a kind of a methodical approach to doing our repair plan, make sure we're accessing the workshop manual, looking at the proper procedures that we should be installing as we're going through the, uh, the repairs on this vehicle to ensure everything's gonna perform like it should. Um, those high voltage batteries are, are happy whenever they're maintained properly and they're taken care of and the electronic systems are there to do that. But it also really relies on that cooling system and that air conditioning system operating at its designed parameters as well for everything to be happy. Uh, we can go ahead and uh, roll 22. So much like you'll see on the uh, sibling vehicles, uh, the airbag sensors we're used to seeing those mounted on that lower radiator tie bar going across. And what you'll find that uh, there's one on each side and then there are a number of electric water pumps on, on this vehicle as with all electric vehicles and some non-electric vehicles um, that are part of that cooling system. Yeah, the electric water pumps are used there so they can spool them up at any time even when that truck is just sitting there. If it gets too hot or too cold, the systems can fire up and they can take care of the battery to maintain its temperature where it needs to be. So, so that, that's an interesting attribute of the electrics and this one included, you know, the noises it makes when it's sitting there. And, and in many cases, those noises are normal. <laughs> yeah. it's, yeah. it's not uncommon for it to fire up and you hear noises, gurgling fluids moving and stuff like that um, because of the nature of these systems where they can fire up and make sure that the, the vehicle's comfortable at all times. So this is just the closing sequence of the, uh, the front hood 
And as it get, goes down onto the latch mechanism, you'll see the drawdown. Again, very typical to uh, many doors and hatches where we uh, then secure that hood shut. Jeff, you were saying on that inside seal on the, on the front tub there, there was a uh, pinch sensors on there? So that actually runs down the sides of the fenders. Okay. Um, the tub in the front actually had a separate weather seal to, uh, to keep water, you know, environmental yeah. out of that front tub. Yeah, so and to keep the ice and the refreshments down there nice there and go. clean and ready for whatever you may prefer to have in that ice chest up front. It does have a drain in the bottom. So then we, uh, we took the vehicle over to a lift over at Precision and we, we lifted it up in the air. Now this was a 10,000 pound lift. Uh, this vehicle is formidable in weight. Uh, you want to make sure you're lifting it at the right points with an appropriate lift uh, of appropriate capacity. Uh, the, you'll notice the arrows at each of the lift points. There's an arrow actually in that frame that identifies where those lift pads are supposed to be. So make sure you've got your arms set up properly on there and uh, vehicle supported properly and we'll run it up be, in the air. We always want to be careful in lifting a battery electric vehicle that we're not lifting on the actual battery pack itself. If we do that, it cause lots of damage and uh, you know potential for uh, bad things to happen. So we always want to make sure we're lifting from those proper lift points. I'll say this, and we're going to see this in this next week. Can you go ahead and, go ahead and roll 25? Um, and maybe just hold this frame until uh, we prompt you to move on. Um, so looking at this vehicle underneath, and we've got the skid plates and the protection plates still in place, the ones that bolt on, but we're gonna remove those in coming slides. But looking at that battery enclosure, and go ahead and let the footage roll up until the highlights come in. Um, so there's a lot of steel in the battery enclosure, and that battery enclosure then takes and bolts to the, the frame of the truck. And there's eight bolts that we've got highlighted here and you can just pause it right here for just a moment. Um, you're gonna find this bolts in. So I, I think about what we saw in the evolution of truck frames back in the early 2000s, where, where we evolved past the open C channel and we went to the full box frames and the welded cross members and how that changed some of what we were capable of doing in frame repairs. <laughs> changed it pretty dramatically, it limited our access. And, and I look at where we've come to, and we've had that full box structure on many vehicles for quite a few years. But now I look at, I look at bolting this battery pack in like this, how much more that plays into, and it's probably not the primary design purpose, but I have to envision that's gonna change a little bit of some of what happens when that vehicle takes an offset hit, you know. Is diamond possible? I'm sure it is if anything gets hit hard enough. I'm just gonna be really curious. It's gonna be interesting. And for those of you out in the audience, um, if you get one of these vehicles, and uh, I'd love to know what your experiences are from the collision side, what kind of damages you're seeing and things like that. Uh, we'll put up an email address at the end and uh, send us a note and, and uh, we can make arrangements to get in contact. But um, it, it was impressive to me what I saw when I lifted this truck up and uh, you know, I started looking at the vehicle from underneath. Um, Jerry, any any additional comments you want to add here about potential? Yeah, parts I mean, on the a lot of the frame material goes to DP 600 and 800 throughout. We have the short stub sections available with the front bumper bracketry and the, um, the sword brackets are on the short front sections about 18 inches to the natural joint right there. We do not offer the full front length section because when you look at the amount of equipment, you're going to have a lot more damage going further rearward into the frame, possibly the battery. We did not see uh, the, the logic of offering those. But the short stub sections, which are very popular and our highest volume parts are, are available. Uh, rear section and the center section are serviced in a complete frame because of the fact of how integrated everything is on it. I can certainly envision where I'm going to say Newton's laws of physics and mass inertia and having that massive battery in the middle, um, those front and rear hits are, you know, that, are, that are more involved are certainly going to um, drive damage up to a certain point that I, I see the logic in the service parts that are available. Um, yes. So we remove the front undershields and that'll give us, that'll expose the view of uh, the front drive motor assembly that we'll see here. 
and the suspension components that are there. Um, you can't see the radiator and the cooling module, but it's laid down in, again, at a pretty steep angle, just in front of that drive motor assembly and that cross member that's just ahead of it. So, Bud, what do you think of this view? It just looks like you've got all your connections all in one spot. It's going to make it easy to get at everything. But uh, again, before you touch any of those pretty orange connectors, make sure you understand what you're uh, getting yourself into. Yeah, these connectors are all uh, very reminiscent of the Mustang Mach-E connectors as well. So, you know, Ford is reusing those parts, making sure that the technicians worked on one has, has seen them all. And, and the skid plate that came off that protected that, it's a pretty substantial piece of metal that's uh, bolted up in between a cross member and, and the next cross member back in the front of the battery. Um, the bottom of the battery has substantial skid plate and protection on it as well. Um, I'm sure it would take a very substantial impact to uh, do damage, and I'm sure somebody out there is going to figure out how to do that. But uh, <laughs> And when you get that vehicle in your shop, let me know. <laughs> yeah. So with, with that front view, we saw the connectors, coolant lines, and, and other things. Um, if for some reason you are working on these vehicles, um, abiding by what Bud mentioned on safety, um, as you disconnect connectors and reconnect them and things like that, make sure you're protecting them from any dust or contamination as well. Um, because uh, a little bit of contamination on high voltage connections is a very bad thing. Uh, so Joel, what did we learn about these wires? So these wires are actually leading back to the pro onboard power um, and they, if you see, they have, they're black with some uh, orange tape on there. So orange is usually a indicator of high voltage. So there's some, uh, not necessarily very high voltage, but there's some high voltage connections going to the so back of the profile. that's not directly associated with the high voltage battery per se, um, there's still. There's still some significant power going to the back to that, right. to that rear yep. uh, pro power. Yeah. And there's, there's a harness on each side that runs back and again, uh, in a side hit. What we did notice is that all the high voltage wiring is actually sitting on the inside of the frame rail that's associated with the high voltage battery, the drive line and things like that to afford that some yeah. additional protection. The rear, the, rear, the rear inverter wiring goes inside the, inside the frame rail uh, behind the battery there between the frame rail and the battery so it's protected. Uh, it's not out and exposed to a, an incident. So this is the uh, rear skid plate that's over the rear drive motor assembly that we, uh, we unbolted. I will caution you when you undo the two front bolts, um, think about body mounts and how um, water sometimes gets trapped there a little bit. And I did have my safety glasses on. So uh, we can see the drive motor assembly and those rear control arms that are just a masterpiece. Uh, I love this. Um, I spent the time to design those, huh? Yeah. Looks like an awful lot of aluminum. There, there, there are references trailing arms in the workshop manual. But, and that's um, different from our traditional uh, gasoline F-150s because this is an independent rear suspension as opposed to a solid rear axle that you'd have in a traditional F-150. Yeah. yeah. And so that's where you'll see the difference in the workshop manual for some of the associated service procedures. We'll take a little closer look at the uh, rear suspension and, the, and drive motor there. Um, coil over. Shock set up here. The rear suspension angles are set by that control arm and the mounting to the frame. There is an eccentric adjustment that'll give you a little bit of toe adjustment if you need to dial in the toe thrust angle. But um, otherwise, uh, camber is held in that control arm and the relationship to the frame where it mounts. You also notice in the back there it has electronic rear parking brakes. So that's something to be aware of when, especially if their car's been in an accident, you know, trying to move it around and those can get stuck. Or if you don't have power to the vehicle. Now we can go ahead and roll 32, where we'll take a little closer look at the uh, at the control arm, and of course, uh, with an electrified rear drive motor setup, we've got the half shafts for the CV axles coming out, which is pretty typical for this type of setup. And um, this should transition to uh, another shot, where we've got a ride height sensor. Um, this vehicle did have and. I'm remiss because I don't remember the terminology, but it has the load sensing feature. The onboard scales. Yeah, the onboard scales. That's it. Thank you very much. Where um, as you load the truck, you can enable that feature and it'll show a bar graph in the rear taillights yeah, for how much pretty, load's in the it's truck. It's a pretty cool feature in the, in the main screen. You can actually see it'll show you how, approximately how much load you have in the bed and stuff like that. And then depending on the, on the trim level, the taillights will also show, you know, kind of bar graph, which is pretty cool. And it's all done off those ride height sensors. 
So if I did rear suspension work or I had to replace that sensor for some reason, anything special I need to think about? Um, after, the, after any of the sensors have been disconnected uh, from the control arm, say you were hitting the rear there and you replace that control arm, um, you would have to go through an FDRS and run the uh, ride height calibration on it. Pretty straightforward otherwise, yeah. A little closer look at the uh, rear drive motor assembly. Up on top of it sits the rear inverter. So they run high voltage DC out of the high voltage battery back to that inverter unit. And then they use that. What do we have on the back of that one? Can you pause that shot right there for just a moment? So here, here we have a, uh, a oil to liquid coolant uh, cooler. So we have oil inside the gearbox, inside the differential electric motor back there. And then to cool it off, we run it through this plate cooler, which is circulating cool, uh, liquid coolant that's controlled by those water pumps and uh, has a heater and a coolant uh, loop in there so it can heat or cool that down to the proper temperature it needs to. So one of the first things I think about with any electrified vehicle is, is I'm doing an initial inspection. Um, I, one of the first simple things I look at is, is the coolant reservoir full? Is it low or is it empty? And I'm asking myself the question of if it's low, where did it go? Or if it's empty, where did it go? And you know, that, that helps me formulate my thought process for, okay, where might there be a problem? It might be just a damaged hose or, or something someplace. Um, but it's, it's something we need to think about. And especially before we try to operate that vehicle where it's so critical that the cooling system is performing properly. Yeah, especially with a liquid cooled battery, you wanna make sure that, you know, if there's no coolant dripping on the outside of the vehicle, we could have liquid coolant going inside the battery, which would be... I, I would think it'd make some pretty substantial damage to drive it that far, but uh, hey, you never, you never, you never know. know in a yeah. collision what's gonna happen. So there's a filter assembly and they do have a decal on the differential that identifies the Mercon fluid that belongs in this. If, for some reason that needs to be serviced. Yes, that's, that's gonna help clean up any of the stuff that's inside there and that works in conjunction with that plate cooler to uh, help cool the system down. This is a shot of the electrical wires that run up to? Those of your full pro onboard power. Pro onboard power. So that, that was that harness we saw earlier that had yep. the black with the, with the uh, orange tape on it. That's it continuing up into the bed uh, in the back there. And otherwise, you know, so far as the rear bumper and the bracketry and things of that nature, it's pretty straightforward F-150. Same. Yep. Yeah. So that's kind of a, an around and under view. Uh, I want to say from a collision repair perspective, rather brief. Um, we could spend hours and hours talking about it. But, um, you know, that, uh, that's, that's what we wanted to bring you in this particular episode. Great. So with that, then we'll... Uh we'll go to some questions that we've got from the, the viewers. First one is, and maybe this is something for, uh, for Jerry, is uh, the question is, is there a service mode that has to be initiated when the vehicle goes into a repair shop? I'm not certain on that one. I'd have to look in the workshop manual for that. I, I, I deal largely with the structure repair and frame repair. Yeah. Um, I would have to defer that one to the workshop manual. I haven't come across one yet, but I haven't scoured the entire workshop manual. So I, that would have to be one of those pieces where you do your due diligence. Um, but I, I have not at this point. Okay. Next question is one that we, uh, I think we got this one when we did the mach -E episode as well, but uh, are there any spray booth temperature considerations? That is outlined in the workshop manual under the general procedures area. We do talk about the duration and the temperature. Uh, be sure you look at that for reference as you get into the workshop manual. And it's okay. pretty consistent with uh, the Mach-E. With, yeah, with others, it is. With others, yep, yep, absolutely. Perfect. Um, next question is pretty similar. Um, it's uh, to the last one here, but this one is about welding considerations when uh, repairing this vehicle. Should the HV battery pack be disconnected? If you get into situations like that, the workshop manual will dictate as far as what to disconnect in the proximity of the welding operation. A lot of the repairs on this vehicle, remember for the unistructure, are gonna be rivet bonded. You will have some welding on exterior panels like the F-150 has now since 15, but you're not gonna be really any near, any, near man, uh, any modules at that point. I would say if you're welding on anything in regards to frame structural, uh, if you're in proximity of a module, you do want to disconnect it and protect it. 
All right, perfect. Now this next question I know is going to be one that Joel likes to see. He's always looking these kind of things up. But the question was, how do you access the vehicle when the 12-volt battery system is dead? Well, this one's actually a little bit easier than the, uh, the Mustang Mach-E because this one actually has a traditional key. So you can, in the fob, you can pull the key fob, the key blade out, and actually open the door. It's no electronic door stuff, which is nice. And then you can get in there and pull the, the uh, release for the, for the front trunk, open it up, and then you can access that cover we saw in the video where you pull the cover off in the back and access the 12-volt battery to put a jump pack on. All right, great. Excellent. Um, Next question probably is uh, a, a more simple answer to go back to the vehicle service manual and make sure that we're, we're looking at that. But the question is, does the battery need to be disconnected for the rear bumper removal? And that's going to be, you know, obviously go back, look at the repair procedures and see what's required. Yeah, I, I wouldn't think so. If it's a simple bumper removal, if we're getting into the charge port, things like that, as far as like, basic body repairs i can't see having to disconnect the high voltage battery for simply unbolting the rear bumper uh but again the workshop manual will dictate that depending on the level of repair and proximity to equipment the the one thing i could say could be a problem there might be the rear charge system um but i would say you would definitely want to have most caution in surrounding areas like the charge port and any other area near a high voltage came component. Yeah, thank you, Jerry. Um, next question is, are the bedsides interchangeable? I'm guessing they're they're asking from the, the standard vehicle to the Lightning, are the bedsides the same? They are not, they're, it's a similar type of attachment, but I know that uh, particularly the driver's side is different because of the fuel filler door versus being smooth on the electric vehicle. The actual attachment and replacement of that panel is not unique. It's the same procedures, rivet bonded, uh, follow the workshop manual procedure, and you do have the options as always. Okay, thank you. Uh, next question is, uh, is there a neutral option to push the vehicle around? So we're always hearing about, you know, EVs and getting them up on uh, go jacks or something as you're moving the vehicles around the shop. So this is a question about, you know, do you need to get that vehicle up off the ground when you're pushing it around and moving it around the shop? Have we seen that in the procedures um, yet? I, I know I, I, haven't, I haven't looked too far into that one yet. We haven't had one physically here for me to, to test out. I'm sure there's a there's an option to put it neutral, but that would require the vehicle to be powered up to, to do that. Um, if the vehicle is not powered up, if go jacks would be your best bet to get it around the shop that way. Um, this one would have to be a Jerry question. It's, uh, are there any restricted parts? No. Ford Motor Company will not restrict parts on our aluminum intensive vehicles of any kind. Our idea is that our vehicles are to be repaired in the average body shop throughout the world, throughout the country. Uh, we have never gone into restricting parts. Um, it's kind of funny that uh, some of the brands that had restricted parts when we were first launching in 15, we were finding we could get on the uh, other markets, eBay and things like that. So yeah. I would say uh, we're going to continue with that position, and I'm very glad for it, frankly. We rather the work with shop certification and training and, of course, support guys like you and make sure that uh, we have everyone up to level. Great. Uh, next question is, uh, well, and this one is probably more, again, about making sure that we research the repair procedures. We've talked about most of their calibrations are going to be uh, dynamic, but the question is, what are the calibrations for ADAS systems? So, so on this one here, pretty much everything's going to be a dynamic calibration. Um, the cruise control module, CCM, would be a bubble level, making sure it's at the right level. Um, most everything else is going to be a dynamic calibration with FDRS. So that includes the CCM up front and workshop manual um, has language in there that speaks to the conditions under which you should be doing the calibrations, but um, or associated repair operations that drive you to uh, to do that. Um, but it, it, it's a cruise control module, the front radar, uh, the lane keep camera, uh, IPMA up in the windshield, and the 360. I will note that uh, even the parking sensors, they have the azimuth test using the like the three foot pole. Um, where they've got uh, information on doing doing those, yeah, but 
operation. Just a verify operation. It's not truly, I want to say, a calibration per se. It's just an operational verification. All right. And it looks like our last question we've got here is, uh, are there any lifting considerations due to the ride height sensors? So that vehicle did have ride height sensors. There were no lifting restrictions on the vehicle. Um, it was pretty straightforward. We, uh, the only time the ride height sensors come into play is if you remove one of those ride height sensor, like the bolts that bolted to the control arm or something like that. When they're removed, they should be recalibrated after that, that fact. All right. Got a last segment of footage. I, I, I do know that. I just want to add here, uh, if anyone has any questions that we haven't addressed here today, you can submit those to repairersrealm at i-card.com, and we will get those questions answered for you. Uh, Jeff, go ahead and roll your last piece. Yep. 36, please. So again, I want to thank uh, Joel and the team down at Precision Diagnostics for giving us open access to their vehicle. Um, it was certainly a pleasure working with them and uh, at their facility. And uh, we can wrap things up here. Jerry, thank you very much for joining yep. us here today. Yep. As Thanks always, for having Jerry, me, guys. It's, it's always uh, a pleasure to be with you and work with you guys. Yeah, it's always great to have you. Uh, we'll look forward to the next one. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right, everybody. Have a great day.